Turning Traveler by Grace Tsai Where? Cramped in darkness, black enough to stain, the wanderer breathes. She is the world's best and only professional stowaway. People often remark about how cold the cargo holds of planes are, but the reality is colder. She likes to compare it to climbing Mount Everest in knickers, an activity with which she is entirely too much experienced to discount the comparison. Half asleep from the familiar lullaby of the engine, an unsensical snatch of melody filtered through hard casing and zippers, she focuses on a destination. She breathes. It's always easier to think about where you're headed than where you are, and especially where you've come from. Thou. He crosses his legs. Whoever made up the Ten Commandments, he thinks with vitriol, was either an idealist or a bastard. The dark-haired girl perched two seats away, takes out what looks like a well-loved, and by extension, well-chewed, dog toy. He uncrosses his legs. He can see the pinched expression on his face reflected in his shiny full leather of his shoes. A peak. It's actually a, a weathered map with creases for valleys and nary an inch of map still pristine, dominated by seemingly random scarlet marks instead of black borderlines. He crosses his legs, pretending to casually stretch to clutch another glimpse of the... Is that parchment? The couple sitting across from him exchange another tender wisp of conversation and he tries so hard to do anything but covet. Or both. God, he hates airports. Art. Sunlight worms its way into the room, lukewarm after having been filtered through the curtains. You had a dream last night. Usually you can't remember your dreams in the morning, except as vague wisps of mist amid a gale. But you remember this one. You dreamed that you were in a cave and the cave was connected to lots and lots of tunnels which are connected to lots and lots of other tunnels. Oppressive silence. Great time to develop claustrophobia, you think. Half panicked, giggling hysterically, feeling the hewn walls with fluttering hands and wishing, wishing you were a bat. A left turn. You stumble on a pebble, surprised at the coarse loudness of your own fear. Keep on. Keep on. Turn left. Seventeen cracks on the cavern floor so far. Another left. You've forgotten what the sky looks like. Oh, eighteen. What anything looks like. Left again. Oh, nineteen. Steady. Left. Slow. Left. Calm. Left. Something in your head is screaming, screaming at you. Left! But you can't care. Not in this yawning darkness. The shrill noise. Left! Echoes unpleasantly inside your head. But left! It's better than left! Nothing. Left! 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 You turn right. And there are three geese, illuminated by shadow, two of them hissing, hissing angrily, and the other, first from the left, your mind garbles unhelpfully, had one of those faces. The ones you see everywhere and nowhere, almost absurdly mediocre and commonplace, dark-haired and dark-eyed, on the street, in the bus, passing by, wandering away, Blinking, but neither sad nor happy. Left, left, left. And that's why you're dialing the phone now. Calling your parents or a lover or an old friend. Because before that one nanosecond, in a startlingly vivid dream, when you had made eye contact with a goose, you had never seen eyes so deserted. That. Mummy? Yes, sweetheart. What's that? That's a box, Tim. No, I mean in 
inside it. Just things, Tim, like what we have in our suitcase. But, Mom, Timothy, don't whine and no touching. Tim, like any other small child would, <clears throat> did exactly the opposite of what his mother said. He touched the box and was unpleasantly surprised when it moved. He glared at it after the initial shock and was determined not to be beaten by a box of all things. So, after quickly checking his mother was still otherwise occupied, he peered into one of the small holes on the side and baby blue eyes met dark ones. Oh no! Tim blinked. A wanderer, if you will. Tim's eyes went very round. He really didn't know what to say to that, so he just murmured softly to himself. I don't whine. Thirty-four years later, Captain Timothy Jones commanded the first expedition in search of off-earth habitation in space. Is she never means to change things, be an influence, cause waves, but sometimes she'll accidentally knock over a cart or meet someone's gaze or allow people to really notice her. It's like dipping a toe into a small still pond. Ripple after ripple of effect travels and bounces back. They reflect off each other and become new patterns of unforeseen circumstance. As a true wanderer, though, she doesn't stay for the aftermath. It's hard not to look back, but fear is an excellent teacher. You really should stay, the kind innkeeper would say, just for a few more days. Saying no doesn't really ever get any easier, though it's part of the job description. She ought to know. She created the profession. She redefined freelancing. This is the price, she told herself each time, eyes shuttered behind frozen lids, and freedom isn't refundable. refundable. She's always very tempted, yet rest is for the weary and she can't afford to be tired. If she never stops, stays one step ahead, nothing, not even loneliness, can catch up. Home. Once, in a photo spot spontaneity, he signed up for a vacation to Italy. It was one of those guided tours designed to make individuals feel like part of a group. But vacationing in a strange land with a bunch of strangers really only makes one more alone. Location, bus trip. Historic location, long bus trip. Scenic location, longer bus trip. Quaint location, Against the very fibre of his nature, he struck up a conversation with a dark-haired girl during the third hour of the seven-hour-long bus trip. He doesn't know why. Probably because being in a foreign country is like being drunk, complete with severely lowered inhibitions and near-lethal injections of foolhardy courage. It was mostly one-sided, but he blathered on since anything was better than listening to the old man in aisle five snore. And then she looked at him with glacier hard eyes and asked him, when was the last time you went home? Dazed, he abandoned the meagre pretense of conversation. He made mental plans to purchase an airplane ticket for the first time in his life. What's well, the first that day? He thought, maybe, maybe his mother was right. She always said he was like tofu, Soft and fragile and mushy on the inside, even after you fry it for a long time. It wasn't until the group returned to the bus after Florence, Florence, that a vaulting, cheerful tour guide would chirp, that he remembered he hadn't asked for the girl's name. He tried to look for her, but it turned out that she was never part of the group, at least not officially. This time completely compliant with the very fibre of his nature, he left the matter well alone and was almost successful in not dwelling upon piercing words and dark, cool eyes. 
He spent the entirety of the plane ride gazing out of the tiny window, grimy with a press of innumerable childish noses and valiantly ignoring a cup of apple juice which looked too much like pea. Flight attendants and fellow passengers alike seemed to sense and be repelled by his mood. So this is what it's like, he mused, to be cold. He stepped off the plane, stepped into a cab, then off the cab and into the house of his childhood. He realised that nothing had changed, not even his parents. They were a little greyer, though he didn't like to think about that at all, except himself. He spent the long return flight cursing the girl with flinty eyes he had failed to forget, but mostly himself for not being able, really, to be cold. Sometimes he lies awake at night, wondering how much cold birds must endure for their freedom. lessons. Um, hi, my name is Katie Darby and I um, co-run Liars League, which is the organisation that got these wonderful actors here together for you today. Um, we've been doing uh, what we do, which is basically um, actors read new short stories by sometimes well-known, but usually more kind of up-and-coming writers, like the ones that Tanya has selected, you know, finding new talent, just like the, uh, the writers uh, and artists yearbook does every year. Um, and that is what we do too. Uh, we've been doing it since 2007. We have um, a company of over 100 actors who we can call on to read stories. And we do it every month. Um, and plug time. Uh, the next event, if you've enjoyed what we did tonight, um, is on April the 9th. It's a Tuesday. We do it on the first Tuesday of every month. And if you enjoy short stories um, and you like to see them performed rather than just read, because some writers are amazing writers and they just kind of read like that, you know, sort of mumbling shyly into their books, uh, but our actors have no shame, they will, they will <laughs> take it right to the back of the, uh, of the stadium. Um, if you've enjoyed it, do come along. Um, our website is www.liarsleague.com. There are postcards at the door and there should be a little business card on everyone's seat. So I hope you liked it. Please do give a round of applause to the writers and artists, to the amazing stories and the amazing actors who've made tonight happen.